The fear of Ebola is spreading in Uganda. We have 101 cases. Out of this, 22 have died. In a world connected by rapid air travel, deadly infectious diseases can spread quickly. Swift tactics are going to have to be put in place if we're going to stop the spread of this horrible disease. New emerging pathogens like HIV AIDS, Ebola, SARS, and West Nile fever can become pandemics. 75 to 85 percent of emerging infections are zoonotic or vector-borne in nature. Crossing continents and oceans with uncontrolled speed. Emerging microbes, globalization of travel, and the greater ease of making deadly organisms in a laboratory place us at greater risk than ever before. Scientists have identified areas where new species or strains of diseases are most likely to emerge, where there are high risks of animal viruses passing to humans causing local outbreaks of infection that could spread worldwide. One of those areas is southern China. We're in Guilin in uh, southern China, um, in one of the most beautiful parts of China with these amazing limestone hills and valleys and very scenic and picturesque. I'm Peter Dashak, I'm the president of EcoHealth Alliance based in New York. The reason we're here is we're interested in the risk of new diseases emerging out of the wildlife trade in China, just like SARS did a few years ago, and just like ultimately HIV did in Africa 40-odd um, years ago. It's very simple, really. You know, we're saying that the future of global health is put under threat. If we can get to the source of where they come from and reduce the risk, we could solve a huge problem and save millions of lives, rather than waiting for them to emerge and trying to mop it up afterwards. This is very typical of the type of market you'll see all across China, where people come in daily to buy and sell chickens and ducks. What it does is it, it increases the risk of a pathogen like avian flu from spreading because you've got live chickens. If one of them's infected, it brings the virus in and it spreads to this flock over a few hours, and then those animals are taken to all distant parts of, of the region. It also increases the contact between chickens and people. Um, when people here are working with the animals, they can get exposed to those viruses, and we've seen this repeatedly from China and other parts of Southeast Asia, new strains of avian flu spreading into people directly from birds. <laughs> yeah, what you see here is um, they're unloading chickens from a farm into these holding cages to be sold on. But what's interesting from a health point of view is one of them's wearing a mask, so they, they're beginning to understand about the health risks. But these cages aren't washed between each shipment. They're reused over and over again. So if you do get infection coming into a flock, it can spread very rapidly. Now, you could see this activity anywhere in the world. This is just like what happens in rural America uh, and rural parts of Europe. But the difference is here, we're in a hot zone for emerging diseases. This is a place where we've repeatedly seen outbreaks from poultry moving into people and spreading globally. How strict we are with biosecurity should be higher here than it is in other places. <laughs> What you see here is some of the chickens are brought over live and then slaughtered very quickly, defeathered and dressed and sold on. This is done in a fairly unhygienic way. It's essentially open to the outside. There are chicken gut piles that are, that are there's blood. Got a lot of flies swarming around. If some of these animals are infected, the flies could pass the infection on. And just over there, we've got a river We've got people fishing in the river, we've got people washing in the river, 
We, we know there's sewage coming directly from the houses into the river. Um, and what looks like an idyllic country scene is, is really a human-dominated landscape. There's not much wildlife here, but wild ducks will come down onto this river as well and mix in and migrate with the viruses and spread them backwards and forwards into this mix. Um, it's, it's a big mixing vessel for pathogens. We're down here at a goose farm, and we're going to be sampling some of these geese to test them for avian flu. The idea is that if we can catch the viruses they carry here, we can prevent them going to market and potentially spreading the disease. OK, ready? We take swabs from the mouth and we take cloacal swabs. We put them in viral transport medium and then ship them on liquid nitrogen to the lab for testing. <coughs> Avian flu is um, a virus that's common in many types of birds, but especially in poultry and waterfowl, it's um, a real killer. And some of these strains can also jump directly into people. So that's the problem. The ones that jumped directly into people have led to previous pandemics, including the biggest pandemic of all time, the 1918 flu, which killed more people than died from bullets in the First World War. Um, uh, many millions of people around the world died from avian flu back then. Yes, yes. We're trying to say, where is the next avian flu going to come from? Can we see it before it becomes a pandemic problem? And stop it. There you go. <laughs> I look at this a little bit like earthquakes. We know earthquakes can be devastating. We know they're pretty rare, and we know where they happen. So this is the same for pandemics. We know that this is a hotspot for pandemics. We know why it happens. But what we're not doing with pandemics that we are doing with earthquakes is reducing the damage initially. This has been going on for 5,000 years. Yes. Guan Zhang is our field operations manager in this part of China. He's um, got a PhD in biology. He's trained in understanding the ecology of bats, and bats are the source of SARS virus. So we needed someone to help us work on bats, and we found out about Guan Zhang. It's really urgent to teach the people how to deal with the virus and uh, just uh, change our normal behavior to decrease the risk of the virus transfer. Yang Huang Ming Mei. Yeah. What is that? I have no idea. Bye. We are going to the Seven Star Cave. This is a big tourist cave. Shall we go? What we're doing now is we're looking at caves across southern China and saying, where is SARS virus right now? Who is going to be most at risk of getting infected? Um, and, and then try and do something about it. We try and work with the local authorities to say, these bats carry a virus that could be lethal. People probably shouldn't go in those caves. What sort of bats have you heard about? I've heard about vampire bats. Vampire bats. But not all bats are bad. And you know what they do? They eat insects, so they eat mosquitoes, and that's a good thing. It's a peacock. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the rhinolophus horseshoe bat. Yeah. Right here in this cave with all these tourists going through. Yes. Yeah. The bats here in this cave are the same bats that carry SARS virus. Bats live in the cave all day long because they're nocturnal. And when they're up there, they urinate and defecate right on top of the tourists that are walking through. And all you've got to do is be that one person to breathe in at the wrong time, and suddenly you've been infected with a, with a virus that is not only potentially lethal to people, it could cause a future pandemic. So 
the chances of it happening are very low, very small. But if enough people continue to come to these caves, it could happen. We sent you the samples from these bats. One of the big breakthroughs we made was to use simple mathematical models to try and understand what's driving these diseases. We went back to every known example of emerging disease, HIV, Ebola, West Nile virus, SARS, plotted where it originated, and we said, what are the things that are going on in those places? The two big drivers are growing human populations, land use change, and high wildlife diversity. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Animals carry viruses that probably don't do much to them. When we come into contact with animals, sometimes those viruses get into our bodies and spread. And that's exactly what happened with HIV. It's what happens with Ebola and with SARS. So we were able to pinpoint on the planet where the next emerging disease is most likely to happen. And this place is one of them. This part of China is famous for its uh, limestone hills which are really some of the last areas of wildlife habitat left in China. People are butting up against those populations and allowing these viruses to move from wildlife into people. When we hear about diseases like Ebola, and we know that that has a wildlife origin in bushmeat hunted in Africa, and there are often misconceptions around that. Do we need to get bitten by a monkey to get this disease? Do we need to kill a bat to catch Ebola? Well, no, what happens is that all across China, people are hunting wildlife, they're bringing them into markets at a growing rate, so there are more and more people making contact with wildlife. Eventually, one of those people gets a virus and it starts to spread. <laughs> So what we'd like to see is uh, more farming of wildlife, where they're being kept in better environment and being tested for viruses. Mr. Wei. Ni hao. Ni hao. This is um, Mr. Wei. He runs this farm. He farms mainly bamboo rats, porcupines, and civets um, for food. But he's also one of the first people to really start this industry here in Guilin. He's also an artist. You always have Pretty Woman and Chickens. He's um, been a really good collaborator and, and one of our champions for the work that we're doing on the health side of this. You have to, come on. What I really like about what he's doing is it's entrepreneurial, um, but it hopefully will take us out of the wildlife trade altogether into looking at these animals as a domestic animal. So this is where you've got the civets and the porcupines. Yeah? Ah, there, there, see? Two of them. Oh, really nice. So these are uh, palm civets. People have been eating them in China for thousands of years. Um, they're so valuable. Each one is more than $200 to buy in a restaurant. So it's a, considered a very special meal, a luxury meal. So, uh, so let's take a look at these porcupines. And don't worry about lunch. Lunch is right in front of you. Why do people in China eat porcupine? Is it, does it have a spiritual meaning? They think porcupine can prolong your life. Oh. Like the porcupine. If you rip a porcupine's skin, and they do rip very easily, it grows back, it regenerates. So that means that if you eat that animal, you will be able to regenerate and heal quickly. So it's thought that they give you spiritual properties. The value of these animals is incredible. By each one of those, he can sell for about 150 US dollars. That meal would be a very special meal. <laughs> and a rich business person would use that as a way to show off the wealth and to do some business around the table. And this is a very traditional part of Chinese culture to have food and business and wealth and spirituality tied together around this. We'll go to see the bamboo rats. Okay. 
We treat all these animals as if they had a lethal pathogen. We've got a fighter. We've actually found viruses in Mr. Way's bamboo rats, um, but they look like a fairly harmless group of viruses that are rodent-specific, that are unlikely to get into people. But, you know, thinking about the other trades that were going on around the time of SARS, no one was checking them. No one was looking for these pathogens. <laughs> and I think this is exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be working with the people who are doing this and try and help them to do it in a healthier way. Ultimately, it would be great to see people moving away from eating wildlife. There are lots of other sources of protein that are safer and better for the environment. But in the, in the interim, over the next decade or so, that's not going to change. There are more and more people in China, and there's a very strong cultural tradition of eating wildlife. This is the most classic image of China. And there you have it, in all its beauty, right next to a bustling city. The overriding thing you see in China, in rural China, in cities, are people trying to make money any way they can. It's quite incredible, from people selling stuff out on the streets to people building new businesses and just trying out a new strategy. All across China, people celebrate food. And then some really unusual food. You've got a bee pupae. I look at southern China as a very rapidly changing place. Um, young people that I meet don't eat wildlife. They eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's the cool thing to do. And I think in 50 years, wildlife for food will have disappeared. But in the meantime, what we're trying to do is just push that process along a bit and help it happen in a safer way, a more humane way, and a way that's better for the environment. So we're very optimistic that things will move towards a more healthy planet. But we just need to move a little bit more rapidly. Thank you.